Welcome to another episode of our personal empowerment audio program, Finding Yourself in Paradise. Hi, I'm Michael Benner. And I'm Steve Snyder. And our program today is on patience, on waiting for things to ripen, on the maturity and the wisdom that comes with developing patience and how patience itself can help develop wisdom and maturity. You know, it occurs to me, Steve, that uh, in order to be patient, we've really got to feel safe and relaxed. It's a lot like the whole process of what we call paradise or the alpha brainwave level common to meditation or introspection, contemplation or reflection. What I mean is if we are impatient, if we want that instant gratification, I got to have it and I got to have it now, don't you think more often than not that comes from fear and anxiety? Yeah, because it's not feeling safe in what you have right now. It's The pain comes from not accepting that the is is. I mean, it's okay that you want this to be in the future. That, that gives the mind a direction to go. But if you're unhappy with what you have now, then that's all that matters is, is what you're experiencing in the moment. So impatience is essentially saying what I have now isn't good enough. I want it to be not this, I want it to be something else. It's not saying that, that I, would, I know the direction I want to go in and I'm happy to be where I am on the journey there. It's saying, I don't want to be here, I want to be there instead. So there's a whole Zen thing to this about the only reality, the only truth of things is right here, right now, not in past regrets and resentments or future fears and worries, but to be patient is to sit right here, right now, I think that brings up a lot of similar words like acceptance, for example, or gratitude, as opposed to those prayers of petition, for example, where people are always aspiring to having more. We know that can get in the way of experiencing the richness of now, of what you already have. It's really important to have in your mind what more is, to know the more you want, the growth, success, and fulfillment you're looking to create. The goal setting we talk exactly, about. Exactly, yeah. really important to do so so that your mind knows the direction to continue its journey. But to be unhappy with the now means the whole thing is unhappy. It is all the journey. So it's all about being patient, that is being accepting that the fruit is ripening on the vine, you know, that the, that you can't pull up your carrots to see how they're doing. You've got to expect they, they know what they're doing. It's all growing. It's all, it's all changing. And, and right now in the process is exactly where I want to be. Patience is not saying I don't want it to be the way I want it to be in the future. It's I'm really happy with the way it is now. And clearly I'm moving toward that future. Here's a tip. Great way to learn patience. Start a cactus garden. What's your hurry? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it seems to me that would engender patience, right? You'd, you'd have to enjoy the cactus being whatever it looks like right now and is likely to look like for a long time. If you need it to be more, better, different somehow, then again, you're missing the richness of what you already have. This is a big dilemma for us in our worldview. What is so scary about where we are right now in our lives, that we have this need to almost ignore it and discount it in some sort of attempt to reach forward into the future and keep pulling the future toward us. Is it just materialism? Or? Well, I, I think it comes back to where you began with the idea of it's about us feeling safe. See, if, if we feel safe now, then we don't have to look off into the future to see if there's any dangers out there that might be coming at us. Uh, that's called worry. You know, we, we worry about danger in the future to come at us. So if we feel safe and we don't have to worry, then we don't need to be, in, our mind doesn't need to be in the future, be preparing for the future so much. And I think we can be more contemplative, more self examining in, in the moment in the now. So are we trying to find some sense of safety in the hope that things will get better in the future? I think what we're trying to do is find some sense of safety in hopes things won't get worse in the future. <laughs> <laughs> you know? Okay. I remember in journalism school, one of the concepts I always found fascinating was that, and this is a, you know, a matter of degree and extent to which, People who read the news do so not so much to be well-informed as to get a sense that other people are much worse off than they are. 
you know, that's why good news doesn't sell. You know, I mean, it, it, I wish it did. You know, it's kind of, but the good news television, good news newspapers don't sell. People take a look at the news and go, oh, he's really, she's really bad off. And so all of a sudden, like, I'm not in such bad straits, perhaps. Yeah, it's like asking your grandfather why he reads the obits every day. And he said, well, to be sure I'm not in it. There you go. You know, there you go. The obituaries. Well, this is a fascinating idea. Now, we've always heard that patience is a virtue, and yet there are times perhaps to let go of her patience and take a step forward. We don't want patience as a virtue to confuse us around inaction or procrastination. Let's look at the difference, though. Procrastination is putting something off and in your mind, there's like, it may never happen kind of thing. Whereas patience is not doing it now because now is not the right time. It's waiting for it to ripen. It's waiting for it to become, for the timing to be right. And, and, and patience, I think a great deal of patience is waiting for the timing to be right. Because you can do a lot of different things. You just can't do them all at the same time. So if you're doing one thing now and there's another thing you want to do, sometimes it's a matter of having patience until this thing is done, until that thing gets to be. I mean, when when you are, like, choosing a calling, a career, you know, you can you can have any calling you, you, that comes from your heart. If your heart's telling you what you can be this thing, you can. But that doesn't mean you can be it now. I mean, you need to understand that there may be education you need or there may be training you need or there may be, uh, you may need to apprentice under someone or you, you may need to learn how to do this thing over a long period of time before you can actually have the dream that you're dreaming. But if you're given the dream and you are you have the patience, you know, and, and you explore what needs to be explored on the road to that dream, you can have most of those dreams can, if not come true, you can live a life of pursuing them that is a life that feels wonderful. I hear the word timing in what you're saying, and I guess in another way we're walking a balance between being spontaneous in our lives and planning, being impulsive and really in, in, enjoy that living in the now with, again, balancing that with the need to have a plan, to set some goals, to, you know, plan for a rainy day, that kind of thing. I remember as a child being told all of these values based on folk tales and fairy tales, you know, about working together in community and teamwork and planning for the rainy day. I mean, what was it? It wasn't the three little pigs. Something about storing the nuts away, the squirrels, and some squirrel didn't. Uh... <laughs> anyway, I think it's in Aesop's fables or some of Mother Goose or somewhere in those fairy tales because that is a Western value, certainly. I think it's just common sense. I'm sure it's found in the East and the Middle East and Africa as well. But we also can see this or frame it in the context of maturity. Because, again, we see little children have this need for instant gratification, and that's not very Zen-like. I want it now is not very zen That's not accepting of the richness of the current situation. It's like I want it to be different. It's basically based in anxiety again. It's understood to be one of the attributes of maturity that we learn about delayed gratification and investing in ourselves and investing in our life, self-improvement, so to speak. And, you know, when you're talking about those two sides of the coin being spontaneous or planning, you know, it's obviously not an either or, it's a both. But, but let's temper both of them because in terms of spontaneity, it's wonderful. But remember to look before you leap, you know, to take that deep breath and p ponder for a moment at least before you are spontaneous, you know. And then when it comes to planning, understand that it's a very valuable thing to do. It just never works, you know. No plans ever come the way they get planned. There's an old adage about uh, people make plans and God laughs. I mean, everybody that's ever run a business knows they've made lots and lots of plans that never actually occurred the way they planned them because things change. I mean, they, they always do. So it's very important to be spontaneous, but look before you leave. It's very important to make plans, but be so flexible that you know the exact plan you made isn't probably the way it's going to work out. And, and with that kind of balance, if it's not this or that, it's a little of both and some of, some of neither, then you can proceed forward in your life with the patience that you need to have. Patience is easy if you know you're going in the right direction and you're happy with the moment you're in now. 
See, if you're happy with the moment you're now, but you have no idea of what the next moment will will be, you know, you don't have a plan at all, you don't know where you're going, that brings a lot of anxiety. Like, where's my next anything going to come from? But if you've got a plan, you know, even if it's not going to work out exactly the way you planned it, but you've got a plan, then you can take a deep breath and be in the moment now and know that the plan is unfolding and the plan is, you know, plan is unfolding and here I am ex- enjoying what I'm seeing and hearing and smelling and tasting and touching and experiencing right now and be patient and know that what I am planning is occurring and I don't have to have it be occurred already. You know, I could be happy with the moment. I think balance is a great word for attempting to resolve the paradox of all of this. And John Lennon's got two great quotations that, boy, I would love to be able to ask him about this. Uh, if only he, he, he were still alive. But he said, reality is what happens while you're making other plans, as if you don't have that much influence. And reality leaves a lot to the imagination. As if you do have a lot of influence. <laughs> okay. So he's obviously on both sides of that coin, uh, and yet I think he understands that both things are true to relative degrees, depending on the situation and the instance. And our job as sentient beings, you know, is to find that balance. Uh, and what that leads me to, Steve, is, again, to go back to what we often think of in world philosophy as sort of a Zen angle on things. Western men and women especially seem to be so determined to create a life, to work for a living, to earn a living, as if they didn't do all of these efforts, they wouldn't be alive, right? I mean, all you really need is to breathe, eat some food, and have enough water, and basically you're okay, right? A little shelter would help, and then comes kindness. We love acceptance. We know Maslow's hierarchy. Again, there's a famous Zen saying, in the spring, the grass grows. Or the snow goose does nothing to remain white. Meaning, you know, there is a quality, there is a time to put all that effort down and just sit and marvel at all that you... This is why I talked about gratitude earlier. You and I have talked about... We've done shows on gratitude. Like, it's one thing to want more. Nothing wrong with that. Set some goals. But how about the power in accepting what you've already got and and sitting receptive and letting life, to some extent anyway, be done to you? There's not only victimness in that, which might be the negative side of it. There's a lot of richness and being that open and receptive to the situation you find yourself in right now, whatever that may be, you know, like like you're bummed out because it's a rainy day. Well, change your attitude. Rainy days can be really cool. It's a nice day to maybe, you know, sit home and uh, light a fire and read a book and pet the cat and make a cup of tea. And yeah, you had plans to go out and do other things, but Life really is what you make it. We say that. I don't know how often we're aware of our power to make that more than an aphorism. Life really is what we do with what's done to us. Yeah, I mean, there are two kinds of attention that we pay, quote unquote, those things that capture our attention and those things that we choose to pay attention to. And in other case, we're in control of that. Yeah, things out in the world capture our attention. But if we're looking for something else, you know, if we're really intent on something else, we don't even see things out in the world that other people would notice just like that. So we have a lot to do with even what captures our attention. And certainly we have the power to choose voluntarily to put our attention on anything we want it to at any given time. So so the ability to be in the now and pay attention to whatever is either coming in from the external world or coming up from the internal world, you know, sitting in the now and doing that, that's that's being patient. Being Patience is being willing to be right here, right now, doing whatever it is that right here, right now leads you to do uh, and not needing it to be some future time. Being unprepared for the future doesn't allow you to feel the safety of the patients. You need to have a plan. You need to have goals. You need to have a direction that you're going to be heading in. But when you've got all those things in place, then uh, the seeds are planted. And and like I said, one of your great mentors said it to you. You said it to me decades ago. You can't pull up your carrots to see how they're doing. You you plant the, the things in the ground and you know that in the ground it's working. And you just feel the patience and know that one day, you know, because all, all the things are going right, these things are going to be really scrumptious carrots 
Well, again, in the spring, the grass grows. I mean, who knows more about how to be a carrot is what I came to. I decided carrots were experts at being carrots, and I didn't really know much about how to be a carrot. Although I got to admit, when Bill Manning, uh, a guest on one of my radio shows, said that, I went home and tried to <laughs> pull up the carrots and then put them back in the ground. They don't like that so much. Break those little tiny roots. They don't like that so much. <laughs> Did not work at all. But a rich teaching metaphor that obviously both of us have pulled upon. So we're working in partnership with destiny. Of course we have free will. But why can't both things be true? Why do we have to, and I know many people don't even bother with it, but a lot of thinking, sentient people are working that equation. Trying, well, how much of this is just done to me and totally out of my hands? I'm going to get blindsided and victimized and life's going to be done to me in such a way that all I can do is resist or fight back. And then we have these moments of awareness that, well, wait a minute, I, I can, as you were saying, Steve, plan. I can set a goal and then determine a strategy to move toward that goal. In fact, even in my overall attitude, my goodness, don't we have enough research by now that it does matter whether you see the glass as half full or half empty. And I think that's part of what patience is about, is that in the same way, like the glass being half full, not half empty, there is a hope, there is a belief in the overall progression, or the word I like is unfoldment in the universe. And within those parameters, like life will grow, it will heal, it will expand. You prune the tree this way, it doesn't care, it'll grow out that way. Okay? You don't want it to be tall, fine, it'll fill out and get dense, but it's going to grow, right? And it's going to heal, and we're going to learn, and our understanding and awareness will expand in spite of ourselves. I think what patience says, in part, is let's do this consciously. Within the bracket of fate, providence, and destiny, let's exercise our free will and also our imagination and weave a tapestry working in partnership with what we can't control. And looking at that metaphor of things being half full or half empty is so static, it's so black and white, it doesn't really work. It's hard to be patient if you don't see things moving, if you don't have a vision. It's really more the glass is half full and filling or half empty and emptying. And so if <laughs> I see... more th dynamic. It's a video, <laughs> not a photo. Yeah, there you go. So if I see the glass is half full and filling, I can be patient. If I see the glass is just half full, is it going to empty? Is it going to fill? I don't know. But that's really an important concept. That's why we have to have a goal. We have to have a direction. The glass is not just half full. It's more than half full and it's filling. And so I can be patient knowing... Like if I'm actually literally filling a glass full of water and I don't have patience until that thing is full, you know, I can't move the thing away earlier. I'm going to wait and have patience until it's full. It's filling. And that sensation, the sensation of I'm growing, I'm succeeding, I'm becoming fulfilled, I'm safe and growing, that's what allows us to be patient and feel the, the joy of the now. We did a program not that long ago on procrastination. And we put that off for a long time, but eventually we had to do that one. <laughs> Again, I, I just don't want to confuse what we're describing as the positive benefits of patience with other forms of inaction or denial or being frozen in our tracks, procrastination, we called it a few weeks ago. I mean, I'm thinking of that story about the frog. You throw a frog in boiling water, it jumps out says, are you kidding? You're, you can't cook me. I'm out of here. But you put him in lukewarm water, and he loves it there. He said, and then you just slowly turn up the heat, and he's dead before he knows it. That's not patience. That's a lack of awareness. But that's a lot of us a lot of the time. Exactly. I mean, expecting that half-emptying glass to start filling up all of a sudden for no reason doesn't make any sense. For no reason. Right. You, gotta, you know, that wishful thinking, that magical kind of thinking, like, oh, everything's going to be okay, when you see that the, it isn't, doesn't make any sense. You, you can't be patient and watch things deteriorate and watch things fall apart. That's not what we're talking about. You can only be patient when you're safe. You can only be patient when things are not falling apart. In fact, they're coming together. The glass is filling rather than emptying.
Well, let's look again at this garden analogy. I can grow radishes in three weeks, but asparagus takes, well, from seed, it takes three years before you really can. You know, melons might take several months. In our lives, some things we can get quickly and some things are going to take more time and we may not always know. I mean, there's so much change in the society right now that a lot of the stress comes from not knowing what's ahead. But maybe better said, believing you need to know what's ahead. I think if we practiced more time being patient and just being in the now, that would give us the stability and the self-confidence to face whatever is ahead. Then we don't really need to know what's coming up. We don't need to manage what's being done to us, we can instead manage how we respond to what's coming at us. To to shed that victim mentality, again, here's another outlet, here's another way to do that. Through patience, we can give up, to a large extent, our victimization and our helplessness. So if that's the direction that we want to go, what's the step that we need to take to move from being impatient, from being moment to moment to moment to moment, to being more patient? And I think the answer is to go from fast moments to slow moments. And that's all it takes is to have one slow moment. That is to take that moment and do more than just smell the rose, but notice how you feel when you smell the rose and notice what thoughts it brings up for you and notice what else that happens inside of you in your whole being in that exact moment that you stop and Take that long moment and smell that rose or take that long moment and appreciate uh, your spouse. And, and a, a moment is, is, you know, I mean, technically it's just a few seconds, you know, but a few seconds can go by with so many things happening you don't even notice a few seconds went by. Or by cutting down the input to just one thought, one feeling, one thing, that slows down that moment, especially with consciousness. Like, I'm slowing down my moment in- intentionally here. I'm going to really pay attention to what this, this next bite of food is going to taste like. That is how you start to experience patience. You're saying patience dilates time. Yes. As uh, patience allows for the quality of Dilates intent. our experience of time. Yeah, okay. Yeah. I think that's what time is. Yeah, I do too, but... It doesn't actually change how long it takes for the minute hand to go from one place to the next place on the clock. It changes how long our perception of that experience is. Subjectivity yeah. as opposed to objectivity. Yes. There is the atomic clock. Yes. And its ticks are very accurate. And there are fast moments and slow moments, even though they have exactly 11 seconds each, you know? And fast days and slow days. Exactly. But our point is by being patient and being in the moment, you can manage the length of that moment. You want it to speed up, get busy, do a whole bunch of stuff. At the same time, and moments go very fast. And especially be playful and have fun doing whatever you're doing. Make it into a game. You want to dilate time, you want it to slow down, then relax, breathe, and put on the tea kettle. And then (laughs) watch the pot that never boils, right? You can actually dilate time with patience. Perception is reality. Reality is perception. It has its objective quality. I'll grant you that. But to me, the bigger truth is... Certainly about time. I agree with that. Yeah, the subjective nature of things. So to sit in it, you know, just to be patient and accepting is the association I'm, I'm making with that right now. And we said maturity. And I think we said opportunity also in that... It's the false self that tends to be anxious and impatient and want immediate gratification. Right. It's the higher self, the true self we find in paradise, that recognizes that all of eternity is just an instant that unfolds perpetually. It's a, a moment that, it's not this big basket of time, eternity, oh my God, how would I ever embrace all of eternity? Infinite time in all directions. No, it's just a little pinpoint of an instant with a pulse. It keeps repeating over and over and over and over again forever. It's a pretty amazing thing. It never gets any bigger than that, you know. It never gets any smaller than that. It always is that. And it's never the same twice. You can't step in the same river twice. It's never, it's never the same instant again. 
that thing that thing that we have in terms of time is so amazing because most people spend most of their time in a time that isn't called the past or the future. Most of the people spend their time in regret or remorse or or in the future in worry and apprehension, and and you know that's not not being here now. So a great deal about patience is being here now. And one of the coolest side effects of learning to be patient is that you become more mature. Now, how is that? Well, a CEO I was working with once said it so brilliantly. He said, if I've got a big problem, you know, I'm not going to put off solving the problem for a long period of time, but I'm also not going to, like, jump into coming up with the answer right this second. He goes, I'd much rather sleep on it than be kept awake by it. So the idea of taking that one extra heartbeat, one extra night, one extra moment to, you know, be patient, maybe a better answer than that answer you came up with will come. Maturity is not jumping with the first right answer. And being patient allows a second or third, maybe better right answer to come to mind. And so patience creates maturity, just like I think with maturity comes patience. A book I once read on leadership said the difference, or one of the differences, between a manager and a real leader is a manager puts out fires. He or she solves problems and then moves on to the next fire and solves that problem and then continues. The leader pauses and goes, what can we learn from this that we can incorporate into the larger scheme to make sure this never happens again? And even if he loses a little or she loses a little bit of time doing that by being patient, learning the lesson, they know that like, well, not unlike preventive maintenance on machinery, that it pays off in the long run. This is one of my concerns with 21st century business at this point is it's too myopic. It's too interested in immediate gratification and short-term. Well, there's no investment in that. I mean, we need to take a look at global warming. Like, that could affect your customers, you know. If they're all dead of hunger because you can't grow food on this planet, they're not going to be very prosperous customers. You have a stake in something like global warming, something that big. Or what you do to the economy. Self-interest can so blind somebody that they fail to see the self-interest in the larger picture. Like not wanting health care for so-called illegal aliens, undocumented uh, people living in America. Or even their kids. Well, what if they have some horrible communicable disease that could be caught if you provided them with minimal health care and then... Thousands, tens of thousands of people don't get that communicable disease. I mean, we're we're often penny wise and, and pound foolish. And I think that's an important point, and brings us to the other side of the argument. Besides patience, you also have to deal with the idea of impatience. You know, and some things you need to be impatient with, like people who think like that. You know, uh, I was reading the other day about this. There's a museum a creation museum where they have pictures of dinosaurs with saddles. Like like 6,000 or 8,000 years ago, they made Adam and Eve and dinosaurs on the same day. You know, like, I have no impatience. I have no patience with that. Or, or Bush saying we have to teach uh, intelligent design next to uh, the evolution theory, you know, in school. As, As if the jury's still out. Yeah, the jury's still out on yeah. it. Like whether evolution actually, because, you know, if evolution happened, how come we still have monkeys, you know? It's like, it's like this is so, ups- I have no patience for stupidity like that. Stupidity meaning not low intelligence. Stupidity meaning contrary to the facts, believing something that is factually not true, even presented with the facts. There's some things we need to have no patience for. Einstein said something about that, that uh, what kind of religion is it that refuses to accept science? And what kind of science is it that's not interested in the mystery and the awe of that which is yet to be known about our ultimate relationship with all things, the spiritual side. So we ought to have science and religion that both seek truth. And, you know, for both of those pursuits, science or spiritual or religious pursuits, patience is still the key. You know, it's still the most important thing because to understand that that the universe is unfolding, whether you're looking at it from a scientific point of view or from a spiritual point of view, the universe is unfolding and, and it's, it's getting, it's growing, it's changing, it's, it's morphing. And for you to not want it to be what it is right now, for you to want it to be something other than it is right now, is not allowing it to become all the beauty that it can become. Your impatience with the universe saying, oh, I don't want the things to be the way they are. I want them to be different than they are right now. That's just that's just selfish. That's just saying saying the universe doesn't know what it's doing. <laughs> you know, 
you need to understand that you have a lot of say. You get to steer the wheel. You know, you have a lot of say, making your plans, having sending your directions. But what is right now is right now. And that isn't going to change until right now is another right now. And you can set the direction of the change. You can set the speed of the change. But what you can't do is make it different than it is. And accepting it for what it is, I think, is the center point of patience. Maybe because I just mentioned Einstein, I'm thinking of another quote about his, and I, and I love this about him, he, he really had this balance between science and not religion so much, but a, a, a passion for mystery and wonder. I mean, he loved to wonder. <laughs> yeah, he did. And his sense of God was really like the unified field theory was his idea of God. Like there was one unified thing that made all the laws of physics work together. Well, I was just going to say this, this uh, second quote that I'm thinking of, he says, I can only paraphrase, but it's something like... Um, we believe that we are separate from each other, living in a universe of separated objects, and that even our thoughts and feelings are somehow separated. But he said that is a kind of delusion. He said a kind of a optical delusion of consciousness. that You just believe you're separate. In fact, he said, and this is where the the metaphysics or the spirituality of Einstein comes in, the wonder and awe and the mystery of it all. The, the little kid that he always kept alive inside him, that golly gee, right? He goes on to say, as Emerson and so many others have said, in spite of this appearance of separation, we are in fact part of a whole. Again, a, a unified universe. It's the element that connects that which appears to be separate with the oneness of all things that remains the mystery. That's the heart and the soul of the mystery. And many would argue that that element is consciousness itself or awareness, peace, inner peace, tranquility, safety, love. I can think of a lot of religious teachers, prophets and masters that have called that love, that that is, as Jung also said, the unified field theory. That's what Einstein was looking for, and he found it in the spiritual and in the willingness to be patient enough to wonder to, my God, what have we lost if we don't not only stop to smell the rose, but wonder at the miracle that is the rose, you know, or or take the time to, as we did as kids, watch the clouds float by and change their form or stare at a starry night and allow your awareness to expand as if you were racing through the heavens, through stars and galaxies, given what we know in just the last 20 years about the universe, the, the incredible magnitude and the beauty of the universe. I mean, if we have any listeners that have yet to Google Hubble telescope deep space photos, please, please, mm. please do that because... <laughs> It'll awaken the wonderment that we all had as kids and somehow lost and can recover if we're patient enough to stand receptive, to sit in the moment, and again, to honor the fact that I'm a willful, spontaneous human being is wonderful, but sometimes I just want to be, stand receptive, and enjoy life having its way with me. Yeah. And, you know, this may be sort of restating the obvious, but it's a whole lot easier to be patient when you think something good's going to happen than if you think something bad's going to happen. You know, it's like for a pessimist to, to become patient means like, yes, I'm going to sit here knowing some bad things are about to happen. Any it's not easy to be patient when you don't feel safe. It's a whole lot easier to be patient if you think something good's going to happen than if you're afraid something bad's going to happen. And it comes back to that initial statement we make that you need to feel safe to be able to feel patient. You know, if you if you know something good is going to happen, if you I mean, both good and bad are going to happen, but you know that you're focusing on the good stuff more and your life is going to be this wonderful journey, it's a whole lot easier to be in the moment knowing that there's no danger coming at you any minute now, you know. Whereas pessimists have this, you know, paranoid fear of bad things are going to happen any minute now. Now, any minute now, any minute now. And so it's real hard to, to learn patience. So uh, another logical thing about being an optimist instead of a pessimist, you know, in, in other case, it may or may not influence the future. I think it does in some cases and doesn't others. But but to be a pessimist is just so illogical because, as I said, you get sick and tired of what has never transpired, you know, to, to make yourself unhappy about something that hasn't even happened yet all the time. 
it's hard to be patient when you're waiting for bad stuff to happen. Well, there, you're saying, again, as we come around to this often, that it's the journey, not the destination. It takes patience and a sense of safety, and everything's okay now to be aware of the moment. You can call it Zen-like, but it's found in many philosophies that it's the journey. Right? You know, you, it's, it's the journey, not the destination. It just popped into my head. You know what it is? It's really it's the journey toward the destination. Yeah. You know, not the journey, not the destination. It's the journey. Well, you wouldn't have a journey if you didn't have a destination. Well, you, people do, unfortunately. They call it like the unplanned life, you know, the unexamined life. They have a journey. They just have no idea where they're heading. You know, and that, what George Harrison said, if you don't know where you're going, any road will take you there. So we're talking about it's easier, much, much easier to be patient if you have a sense of where you're going, heading toward at least and that you know that you like it out there, you know, and, and so you can be content in, in the moment, content in the moment, that the moment is the moment, that this is, this is great. What is, is wonderful. And that I want other stuff to happen, but I want it to unfold. I don't need it to happen now. I want to watch that fruit ripen on the tree. I want it, I want it to go from green to the purple plum that it's going to turn into. I don't want to pick it too soon. I want to watch it grow, unfold, awaken. I want, it, I want to watch it become what it is, you know, inside of itself to become. The process, the dynamics of it all, yeah. And uh, uh, tip of the hat to old Socrates, remember, he said quite simply, the unexamined life is not worth living. Yeah, I mean, that is life, is to examine who am I, why am I here. You can't do that on the fly while you're focused exclusively on getting someplace else, putting this step in front of that step. And I saw a female mountain climber on The Tonight Show years ago. In fact, Johnny Carson was still hosting in those days. And he asked her whether there's a difference in the way women climb mountains as opposed to men. And she said, well... Yeah, men want to be on top. Well, everybody, of course, <laughs> laughed, thought that was pretty funny, you know. But she said, no, seriously, um, men need to conquer the mountain. They need to force it into submission. They need to attain that destination, that destiny, right? Women, on the other hand, is more of a dance. Like, wherever we are, like, if we're halfway up or two-thirds of the way up the mountain and it rains and we got to go back, it's like, well, that was cool. You know, that's okay. We didn't need to, you know, conquer or force the mountain into our submission. They don't have that testosterone thing going on. So I think there is more patience in focusing on the journey than being obsessed by the destination or the outcome. Yeah, and again, if if your sense of the journey is that it's a safe journey, you know, that you're moving in the direction that you want to be moving at the speed that feels not uncomfortable, at least for you to be moving at, then it's easier, much, much easier to be patient in the moment. And and to choose those things you want to be impatient about, you know, I think it's important. Uh, if, if you find yourself procrastinating doing something and that's important for you to do, well, getting impatient with yourself and kicking yourself in the butt and making yourself get started, you know, the starting is the hardest part of accomplishing in many, many cases. So, so, so there's, there's room for impatience in your life. Uh, being impatient and intolerant of those things that are intolerable, I think, is wise. But being impatient about your life, like your overall life, you know, like I wish the life I have right now isn't the life I have right now. That serves you in no positive way and, and it creates a lot of negative stuff going on. A lot of negative stuff for your physical body. It causes tension, a lot of physical, uh, emotional ramifications. You feel anxious, you feel nervous, and mentally it causes confusion and feeling unsafe. It's just it's just a bad place to be. So wherever it is you are, you know, you can always look at where you are in perspective and say, well, where I am isn't great compared to so-and-so, but it sure is great compared to such and such. You know, you can always look at where you are and say, hey, this is, you know, where I am right now compared to or, you yeah. know. That's Einstein, and it's all relative. It's again. all relative, you know? or or that your friend's three legged dog. You know, yeah. <laughs> you know, it's like really happy that he's not a two legged dog. That's for sure. Could be worse. <laughs> yeah. One more quick story, and we can do an audio journey about feeling safe, about slowing down, about learning to be patient as a virtue, and as a really a path toward discovering the higher sense, the 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 more truthful sense of who you are. Just a few weeks ago on Oprah, and I. I don't often get to see this program, but my wife's really good at TiVo now, so she's grabbing a little bits for me and said, this is one you might want to see. And, you know, Steve, every summer 
we hear these stories in the news about people who forget their kids in the car, mm. leave them locked oh, in the car, or the oh. dog is locked in the car, and they say, what were you thinking? And they shrug and hang their head. And, of course, the, the point is not that they weren't thinking when they forgot the kids locked in the car. They were thinking too much. Yeah, too many thoughts. You know, what were you thinking? Well, I guess I wasn't thinking. Oh, yes, you were. A mile a minute, no doubt. And so Oprah had this woman on that had done this. And she was extremely contrite. She was weeping. It had been years since it happened. Her husband was there, said he never blamed her, knew he was capable of spacing out in the same way. This baby was two years old. And what they had done was break their routine. Dad usually dropped the baby off at the daycare. He had a dental appointment, asked mom to do it. Mom said, sure. Went back into her high-stress ritual-like routine, put the baby in the back. The baby's asleep. She goes to school, and not till 4 o'clock does a fellow mm. teacher come in. And say, so you know what she's doing? And the reason she's on Oprah is to promote slowing down. Wow. That would do it, wouldn't it? Now, one of the things that they talked about that I thought was real important was well, the way they said it was don't break your habits, don't break your routine, but I would say do a good job of managing what you do habitually and an even better job, maybe if I can say it this way, of remaining awake and yeah. alert. Yeah, do your routines, but be conscious of them. You know, Habits are wonderful. We talked about this a week or two ago. Habits are wonderful as far as they go, but you know that I breathe habitually or walk habitually – that's one thing. I, I don't want to communicate with my spouse habitually. I, God forbid I do my job habitually. I think our listeners would know immediately if we started phoning this thing in without really being present and caring about what we're doing. So her point anyway was stress management. you got to slow down. you got to breathe. She was saying to create better habits. I'm saying to wake up and minimize habitual behavior. Wake up, be awake, be alert, be the awareness. More than the thought and the feeling, be aware that there's a stream of thoughts and feelings going by and you don't have to obsess on them. Yeah, you have the choice. I mean, everyone has the ability to become more patient. It just uh, takes some time and sometimes you have to be patient, you know, until <laughs> till it happens. And, and as Tom Petty said, the waiting is the hardest part, you know. It, it, it is true sometimes. It's wanting something to be the way you want it to be and not the way it is. Waiting for waiting for something is really hard, but you don't have to experience it that way. You can experience it from the point of view of enjoying the, the journey, enjoying the is. You know, the experience of waiting means I'm not happy with this. I want that to be, you know, the experience of like riding along toward it, you know, that, that's a much different feeling. And, and, you know, it's, it's really about learning patience for a lot of reasons, not the least of which is it's one of the greatest ways to create maturity. And whereas maturity often creates patience, you can become mature earlier by learning to delay gratification, by learning to look before you leap, by learning to uh, enjoy the ride and not need the is to be other than the is is. So what's your hurry, right? Uh, you know, John Wooden said, go fast, but don't hurry. Yeah. That's, you know, you can go fast. You, you can go really fast. I mean, look at me. I go really fast sometimes. But hurrying is always about impatience. One of the revelations I had in Los Angeles before coming to Hawaii, after 35 years in L.A., we're driving down the freeway, my wife and I, and everybody was in such a hurry. It was early in the morning. And then, of course, I had lots of experience with afternoon rush hour, and everybody was in a hurry to get home, I guess somewhat more understandable. But one day it hit me, Steve, not that long ago. These people are not so much in a hurry to get someplace. They're running away. Yeah, they're in a hurry to not be here, to yeah. not be where they are. And I think there's some self-sabotage, some uh, death wish stuff rolled up in that. It's not fun to think about, but life for a lot of us is so tough, so difficult, so challenging that we unconsciously act out ways to hurt ourselves, destroy ourselves. I mean... Why would a quarter of America still be smoking cigarettes in 2009? I don't understand. Like, you can give that up. You know how bad it is for you. 
Obama just signed a law, they're going to make the warning signs on cigarette packages even bigger. Well, you know, they could print on the carton, you will die, and people will still do oh, it. Oh, yeah, the, the, the pesticide thing, you know, with the ex, the, the, the skull and head with this guy, it, would yeah. work. it wouldn't work. They did, no. people Poison, do. toxin. Yeah, people would still do it. Yeah, so got to take a look at that. They could make it glow in the dark and people would still smoke those suckers. Are there places in your life where you think you're important, you think you're being productive, you're in a hurry to get someplace and get something done, or are you just running like those hamsters in those cages and you don't know where you're going and you don't know why you're doing what you're doing? Then be patient, as we'll show you now in this audio journey. Find yourself in paradise. You'll find there's a whole new self waiting to be discovered. You got it locked up inside. It wants to get out. And you've got the keys. You remember on the old Mayberry program where Otis would let himself into Andy's jail and then the <laughs> sleep keys, off another one. <laughs> yeah, the keys were on the wall. He could let himself out anytime he wanted and go home after he slept it off. That's exactly what we're talking about. You've got the keys. And here we go. Okay, the keys to that place where the glass is more than half full and continually filling. Ah, the place that always begins with one slow, conscious, deep breath. So take that now and release. And with that breath comes that sense of peace. Physical tension, release, anxiety, cease, and confusion, replace by what's clear. And that's this paradise place, this peaceful place right here. Right now, be safe. Feel relaxed and be patient. It's less an effort than an allowing or permitting yourself to feel okay right now. To stand open and receptive to the richness of this moment. To let this be enough. Consider the phrases, make a living, or earn a living. Of course, we all have bills to pay. We need income streams. We want to contribute to society in a positive way. We want people to accept us, and like us, and maybe even be proud of us healthy relationships. We have these concerns. We have responsibilities in our life. But you're not all alone. You're working in partnership with fate or destiny or providence. Be patient enough right now to consider that both things are true, that you have free will, you have liberty of choice, you are a conscious, sentient being, and if your choices seem limited, you could choose to believe there are even more choices and dream those up, too. How magnificent is that? And yet, there are those factors, those elements beyond our control. Why can't both things be true? To a relative degree, an 80-20 one day, a 20-80 the next. 70-30, sometimes maybe even 50-50, you know? But there's a breath, an in-breath, and an out-breath to what part of your life are you going to initiate? And what part are you just going to accept? That is the end of things, but is the beginning of a situation where you now initiate even more like the partnership of a gardener to their garden or a computer programmer to the computer 
Who gets credit? Who's doing all the work? Is it a candy mint or a breath mint? Stop. It's both. Be patient and find this point in the middle of acceptance and receptivity as a beginning, not an end, a place to initiate your conscious responses. And then be patient and see your thoughts and your feelings, your dreams, goals, and aspirations as seedlings that need time, this providence, this destiny, in order to unfold. Be patient, because good things are coming, and you must let them ripen on the vine. Be patient, because hard things are coming, and you must relax and give yourself time to prepare before you get there. So whenever you can, take a moment and slow that moment down by releasing all the other thoughts and focusing on that single thought and exploring deeply what that thought does inside of you, what feelings and other thoughts come through. Slow moments. Be patient. Things are unfolding just right. The glass is more than half full and continually filling. This moment you're in right now, it's thrilling. And the next moment unfolds if you're only willing to be patient in the moment that is. Things are getting better in the direction that you choose, moving at the speed that's best for you to use. But right now is the moment, the only moment for you to use. And be patient with this moment inside. And make this moment, this special moment, last a long, long, Remind yourself you can return to this place and repeat this exercise and others from programs in this series to learn patience, to develop your conscious awareness of the true self you find in this peaceful, patient place we call paradise. Find yourself in paradise. In a moment, I'll ask you to open your eyes wide awake and alert with a full memory and deep understanding of what we've done. I want you to deliberately, consciously take a nice, slow, deep breath, pulling in strength and power, inhale all the way, hold for a moment, and now and open your eyes wide awake, refreshed, alert, rested, and... Uh, Feeling like there's lots of time, I feel pretty patient. Yeah, there certainly is the same amount of objective time that everybody has, but subjectively, those people who are patient experience time in a much, much more wonderful way. So uh, have patience uh, with other people. Understand that they don't get things as quickly as you do sometimes. Have patience with uh, those things that are changing and growing, but... Have no patience and no tolerance for those things that are hurtful and painful and, and that, you know, you can speak up and do something about. There's a place for patience. There's a place for impatience as well. Think of an impatient person that you know, the first person that pops into your head, and go to FocusedPassion.com and use the Send One to a Friend tool right at the bottom of the built-in audio player to forward this program to them. won't cost you one penny. Forward these programs to people who you know are looking for this kind of material or certainly would benefit from it. You'll get a benefit. Everybody wins in a situation like this. Pay it forward. Imagine a more patient world. We can only do that one person at a time. You know more people than we know, so pass them on. I expect one day millions and millions will be listening to this, but then I have patience. So. And as always, be gentle, love life, and take care of each other. For Steve Snyder, this is Michael Benner. Aloha from Maui.